Shem Hashem Na'asev Na'atzliach, Shur Torah, Bukhim Abayim. We are uh, back here, Baruch Hashem, continuing our uh, Tuesday night shiur of the uh, Igeret Agad, the Gaomi Vilna's letter to his family uh, after uh, before he left to Eretz Yisrael. Uh, which, of course, as we've learned already over the last few months, is not like uh, you travel today. Uh, so this, uh, when Chachamim would travel from uh, where they were to Eretz Yisrael, it was uh, almost a, uh, a certain life risk and many times uh, a, a permanent trip. Uh, but uh, nonetheless, in this case, actually, the Gaon uh, returned. But uh, th- still, the, uh, the lessons of the uh, letter... Um, continue to return to us each and every single week as uh, we learn more and more of the the, the words of the living God where Kadosh Baruch Hu gives the Chachamim certain chokhmah, uh, and through their words we uh, we understand what HaKadosh Baruch Hu wants from us. Tonight's you will be for uh, the Ilui uh, Nishmat Shulamit Bat Yafa uh, and also Leavdil Refua Shlema of uh, Rabbanit Levana Bat Sara, Rab Ephraim Ben Shulamit, Rabbanit Sara Bat Anat, uh, Avi Mori uh, David Ben Esriya, Doris Bat Jora, uh, Orit Bat Ilana, uh, Sara Bat uh, Sausan, and uh, also for a Atzlacha uh, Rabba for Amir Ben uh, Shahin, uh, Netanel Yosef Ben Avraham, and his Kala uh, Shava Mayan Bat Sara. Uh, also for uh, for uh, David Ben Esriad, Oshri Ben Doris, Gabi Ben Doris, Elad Ben Doris, uh, Doris Bajora, uh, Itro Ben Avraham, Shaul Ben Farzane, Marsha Bat Juli, Ayla Bat Marsha, Samuel Ben Marsha, Alexander Ben Marsha, Sefas Ben Marsha, and Louis Ben Marsha. Kadosh Baruch Hu, Yivarech Otam, and all of Am Yisrael and all of the righteous Noahides that uh, are uh, looking to uh, do everything possible to fulfill HaKadosh Baruch Hu's, uh, commandments in every way, shape, or form, uh, which requires non-stop sacrifices. Uh, as a brief update uh, for everybody, tomorrow night, Bezat Hashem, uh, as you would have it, the, uh, the big shiur, uh, live shiur with a live audience here in Florida, South Florida, uh, is uh, on pace. Uh, Bezat Hashem should be a very uh, interesting event uh, for all of you that are uh, living within the vicinity of South Florida. I highly recommend uh, you attend. Bo Hashem, the RSVP list is uh, pretty packed. Uh, we're going to try to uh, um, bring a package uh, for a cube package for each and every guest with some interesting things, some CDs, USBs, different, uh, Baruch Hashem, different gifts for those people that uh, are um, dedicated enough to make the trip, Bezot Hashem, and uh, try to uh, say some Divrei Torah that is going to give us some Chizuk, and uh, for everybody that's willing to learn with us, Bezot Hashem. So that's planned tomorrow night. Anybody that uh, um, wants to save themselves some time, uh, getting into the gated community because the Bet Knesset is inside of gated community uh, needs to send the RSVP uh, tonight. Uh, tonight, I would say at the latest RSVP is maybe by tomorrow morning, but uh, that's really it because uh, once I send it, uh, that's really it. I can't really make much changes, uh, which means that if you're not on the RSVP, uh, it'll take you more time to get through the gate. Uh, you'll still be able to get in, Bezal Hashem, uh, but uh, you know it'll take you more time and uh, uh, to get through the gate, which uh, you know it's not not exactly ideal. Um, so with uh, with that, Bezal Hashem, we're gonna go into uh, what we've been discussing. Those of you that uh, follow the channel, follow the Bezal Hashem app. If you don't have the Bezal Hashem app on your phone, then your phone is worthless. Uh, you need to download the Bezal Hashem app. Uh, because it's the best way to watch our shiurim. You are now able to watch our shiurim on the Bezat Hashem app live. Uh, also, if you have a desktop and you want to watch it live, you don't need to go to uh, Facebook. You could do it on bh.live. B-H, B as in Be'ezrat, H as in Hashem, dot live, L-I-V-E. If you go to Bezat Hashem, so you could live for eternity, Bezat Hashem. Uh, so you can watch it on the app live, you can watch it on the, uh, your desktop live, 
Uh, of course, you can watch it on uh, Facebook as well, but uh, there are better choices out there. But of course, we'll continue doing the Facebook Live when possible because it's the best way to get new people. Uh, but for those of you that have been watching for a while, there's definitely better ways to watch the shoe without the distractions and, uh, and that are out there with, the, uh, with all the other uh, places. Uh, aside from that, for anyone that uh, wants to uh, become a sponsor in the uh, lecture tomorrow, or really any other lecture, uh, to have uh, the uh, uh, be a partner in all of the merits of all the people that come to the lecture and all of the people that ever watch the lecture, uh, take on mitzvot, whether it's tefillin or it's tarat mishpacha or it's kashrut or it's shabbat or it's uh, you know gamabrit, uh, all of the different mitzvot baruch Hashem that people. Uh, learn from our shiurim, you want to be a partner in it, a legitimate partner in it, then uh, I highly recommend sponsoring, uh, becoming one of the sponsors of the shiur. Uh, on the uh, newsletter we uh, sent out uh, today, the, uh, there was a opportunity to sponsor the uh, lecture, uh, and uh, you could also go to our website, bezatashem.org, and go to the uh, store, and over there, there are three different options of uh, sponsorship. Uh, $1,500, $3,000, $4,500. Now you ask, oh, what is a rabbi trying to get rich? Not a single one of those dollars goes to my pocket. It's all for the cost of the actual operations of running it. And I can tell you that with each uh, each member of each of the audience getting a package, this event is probably costing us, uh, without the cost of staff and anything else, probably just the packages alone are going to be somewhere close to around four or $5,000. So, Baruch Hashem, we invest, unlike many other speakers out there that uh, ask for three, four, five, six, ten thousand dollars, twenty thousand dollars to come. We don't charge, and in fact, we invest. We invest into uh, into the public because we know that uh, if you're really going to affect people, you can't let money get in the way. So, we invest. We let a Kadosh Baruch Hu pay for it. If you want to be the vessel that a Kadosh Baruch Hu uses to sponsor the lecture, uh, you're uh, more than welcome to. Uh, but either way, you can attend without taking even a dollar out of your pocket and learn and Bezat Hashem get closer to HaKadosh Baruch Hu. Uh, so of course, anyone that uh, watched the uh, video from uh, this week that we came out and then again today, we made a clip out of it, of the uh, spiritual debacle that is, uh, has happened and is happening in Phoenix, Arizona with the, uh, the wicked reform rabbi that calls himself Orthodox, uh, Michael Aminov. Um, you know, the, the, unfortunately, the debris of the disaster is, uh, non, is, is coming nonstop. Different victims from the community uh, are, uh, you know, reaching out, are, you know, uh, having a very difficult time understanding the ramifications of what this means, of having a rabbi that's connected to the missionaries and don't think for a moment that Aminov regrets his actions or is even uh, apologizing or is even changing. In fact, uh, I got a word and even a video today uh, from somebody from the Kila uh, or the community that uh, showed that those missionaries, those Christian missionaries that have not an ounce of Judaism in them uh, are still praying and still leading the prayers in his synagogue today, after everything came out, after it's exposed, after there's in sport, stories in the papers about it. He is still adamant about his heresy because he firmly believes that all religions are the same. Uh, when somebody sent me some information that he originally got his smicha from uh, some reform uh, uh, organization, uh, literally reform, uh, I, I, I I thought it was the wrong person, but uh, I, I, after investigation, we saw it is the right person, and we see that the orthodox uh, title or the orthodox uh, so-called smicha that he got was really just show business. Has nothing to do with reality. Has nothing to do with his understanding of halacha. Has nothing to do with his actual beliefs. He believes in money. That's all he believes in. Uh, he thinks that everybody is the same, whether Jews or Gentiles, it's all the same. And with all due respect to all of the good Gentiles out there, everybody knows that if you're a Jew, you're a Jew. If you're a Gentile, you're a Gentile. And uh, you cannot say that if a, uh, uh, you know, if, if the Gentiles are a really nice person, you could change the Torah for them. It simply doesn't work that way. 
Uh, so here in this case, we're not talking about good Gentiles. We're talking about evil ones. We're talking about missionaries that are trying to get people to worship an idol called uh, Jesus. Uh, so uh, when you have them in the community alone, it's a disaster. When you have the rabbi helping them, uh, I don't even know what to call it. It needs to perhaps uh, needs to be a, a new word in the English dictionary for it. In, in Hebrew, we would call it chorban. Choban is uh, means disaster, but it's a little bit more significant than that. It's the choban of the uh, destruction of the Beit Hamikdash, uh, and this is really a destruction of a uh, of a Mikdash in Phoenix, Arizona's Jewish community. But unfortunately, many people are still ignorant about the issue, uh, where they don't realize the ramifications of it. They think there is uh, maybe there's lashon hara, maybe there is a war between the Ashkenazim versus the Sfaradim and they're making stuff up. Maybe there is, uh, we're not giving them the benefit of the doubt. Maybe uh, we're jealous and all types of other mumbo jumbo uh, on that end. And then there's also people that are really interested in finding out who are the victims. Who are the victims that have gone through these fake conversions of Aminov and his missionary partners who are the victims that have his mezuzot? Who are the victims that have the ktubot? Who are the victims? And of course, even though we have some names uh, and we're trying to help everybody that, uh, that we possibly can in any way that we can, uh, we can't release those names. Uh, simple. And we'll go over the reasons why today. In the Shi'ur B'Siyat Dishmaya, as HaKadosh Baruch Hu always does uh, chesed for us, he connects the world to our Shi'urim B'Siyat Dishmaya. So, the Gaon Vilna told us last week how, you know, when a person has suffering in their life, they have all types of agony, whether it's financial problems, health problems, marriage problems, all of these different things, you have to always uh, use the ultimate cure, which is more Torah studying, learn more Torah. Now, unfortunately, there are some people out there that learn Torah every single day, but with every single page that they learn, they actually become further from Hashem. Their marriage gets worse. Their life gets worse. Their financial circumstances deteriorate. Why? Because they're not learning Torah that's from Shemaim. Lo Shemaimi. Their Torah is not from Shemaim. They're learning Torah from heretics. They're learning Torah from Apikosim. They're learning Torah from their own mind. And uh, they become a Megale Panim Torah. They become a person that distorts the Torah into their own version of it. And they start disrespecting Gdole Olam, the, uh, the giant sages of the world, and uh, start comparing themselves to the poskim of, uh, of the previous generations. Uh, they start uh, comparing themselves to the big rabbis. Say, no, no, I listen to Rav Avadia. Wait, you listen to Rav Avadia, but your wife is wearing a wig because you are telling her to wear a wig because you don't like the way she looks with the mitpachat. How exactly are you listening to Rav Avadia? No, no, I listen, I listen. How do you listen? I have his books in my house. Did you read the books? No, they're in Hebrew. So how exactly do you connect yourself to Rav Avadia? How? How exactly? Why? Because you have a picture of him on the wall that makes you connected? You're as connected to Rav Avadia as Aminov is connected to Rav Avadia. It's a shamayim va'aretz. It's, it's a, uh, people are, are delusional with the things that they do and sometimes they're so delusional that they think that, listen, I'm right with my little uh, 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 two-inch brain and, uh, and five-minute experience, and I know better than the big rabbis. They don't understand. I understand. Uh, I know Judaism better than they do. I'm a you know, one-year-old convert. I'm a five-year-old uh, Baal Tshuva. I'm even a 20-year-old uh, uh, from a uh, uh, person, and I know more than the Gdolim. And people are unfortunately so delusional, they don't even realize the magnitude of the words that are coming out of their mouth so one of the things that a person needs to understand is that if your life in so many words sucks it's because of you it's not because of anybody else it's not because of your wife it's not because of your husband it's not because of your kids it's not because of your job it's not because of anything other than your actions you are doing this to yourself it's like punching yourself in the face and saying oh why'd you hit me this is this is in essence What's happening to a lot of people? Their marriage is in the toilet. Their job wants to fire them. Their spouse can't stand them. The kids don't even say hello when they see them. And they're wondering, oh, what? But, but I'm religious. I keep Shabbos. 
you can keep Shabbos all you want. It's not the entire Torah. It's a very big mitzvah. Without it, there's no Judaism. But don't think that just because you don't drive on Shabbat, that uh, that automatically makes you righteous. You have to also understand that you have to follow what the laws say. One of the major things that a person needs to know is to follow the Chachamim and what they say. If you are not only not following them, but you become a Chacham in your own eyes, then you're bound to destroy your life. And Hashem, out of His own mercy and kindness, is going to literally torture you in your life in order to try to get the message to you. He's going to give you all types of marriage problems and financial problems and health problems and every problem that he sees necessary in order to get you to finally scratch your little head and realize, oh, what do I need to change? Because most of the time people have problems and they figure maybe I'll change a job and therefore my life will get better. Maybe I'll change a wife and then my life will get better. Maybe I'll change a bank account. I'll go from uh, Chase Bank, I'll go to TD Bank. Or I'll go to uh, this one bank or discount bank. Right? They think that if they change a bank or they change a tire, that's going to uh, change their life. In reality, all it's going to do is just waste more of your time and change absolutely nothing other than increase the aggravation. If you want to change your life, as the Chachamim say to us time and time again, you have to learn more Torah. But learning more Torah doesn't only mean open a book and just read it. It means apply it to your life. And the Sharet Tshuva says it uh, specifically that a person that wants to shield themselves from the suffering of this world has to increase their Torah. Has to increase their Torah. Now, with that being said, the Gaumi Vilna continues in his extraordinary letter and says the following, V'kol rega v'rega, sh'adam chosem piv, zoche bishvilo leor aganuz, sh'en malach u'briya yecholim l'shair, ואומר הכתוב, מי האיש חפץ חיים אוהב ימים? נצור לשונך מרע ושפתיך מדבר מרמה. The first section that we're going to go over today is really one that needs an extraordinary amount of analysis, but for the uh, sake of uh, time, we're going to try to cover it on the surface, based on the ship. The Gaon Mivilna, that uh, many believe that he was uh, even at the level of the Tanaim. And if not the Tanaim, at the very least, the Rishonim, meaning if not the, at the same level of uh, wisdom as the sages of the Gemara and the Mishnah, uh, at the very least, he was at the level of the uh, times of the Rishonim, which is 800 years ago, uh, like the Rambam and the Ramban, Rabbi Yuna. Uh, and uh, the Gaumi Vilna is uh, trying to simplify it to us and telling us a critical secret to cure many of the ailments that a person has in their life, both physical and spiritual. For every second that a man seals his mouth, says the Gaumi Vilna, he merits on that account to bask in a concealed light something which no angel or other creature can imagine. As it's stated in Tehillim chapter 34, verse 13 and 14, who is the man who desires life and loves days that he, that he may see good? Guard your tongue from evil and your lips from speaking deceitfully. So here we see that the Gaon Mi Vilna is giving us a critical secret to success but even more so a cure a cure for literally all ailments that a person brings on themselves in simple street language shut up more you'll be better that's in essence the 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 simple terms but we'll ask why why do i need to make myself a mute as the sages advise Sage advice, you, 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 the best idea for a person is to make themselves into a mute. Don't speak things unless it's absolutely necessary. And even when it's absolutely necessary, you have to double check if it's permissible, despite your own understanding of it being necessary. And again, if, uh, if there's no other choice, you have to understand that speaking has a price, a very big price. So such a big price 
that most of the damage that happens to a person's life is because of their speech, because of how they talk and what they say. He decides to tell his wife, honey, I love you, but uh, I think maybe you could afford to lose about 15 to 20 pounds. Already in a matter of five, maybe seven seconds, he destroyed his marriage permanently. And with that, with that advice, that advice that he gave his wife to lose 15 or 20 pounds, whether right or wrong, he simply destroyed his marriage, most likely permanently, uh, because the confidence of a woman, confidence of a woman, comes from the perspective of her husband. Meaning, how he views her is how much confidence you have. If he insults her, abuses her, thinks she's ugly, thinks she's fat, thinks she's too skinny, thinks she's this, thinks she's that, she is going to be a, simply a miserable, uh, a miserable person, a very sad person. And if, she, if a sad wife is a sad life, but he thinks that he's doing her a favor. What? Rabbi, it's true. It's true that, that, that she needs to lose weight. Whether it's true or not, that's really based on your perspective. Uh, but even more so, even if something is true, doesn't mean you have to say it. You know, and, and, and really even more so, sometimes guys forget that they themselves are not exactly such a catch. For whatever reason or another, guys are very critical of their wives' looks. And they forgot that they also have an image that stares at them when they look in the mirror. And they're not exactly a, uh, a beauty uh, prince. Uh, <laughs> and that's the funniest thing in the world. Guy says to you, listen, Rabbi, I don't know what to do. This, uh, this, uh, this wife of mine or the shiduch, I don't know. I think uh, she's a little too heavy for me. And who are you talking to? You're talking to a guy that uh, he himself is at least 30 to 50 pounds overweight, has a one or two teeth missing in noticeable places, barely knows how to complete a sentence without making a mistake and has about four dollars in his pocket three of which he borrowed from his mother yet he has the audacity to become a mr critic of his wife or of his uh you know somebody that he wants to go on a shiduch with and it's bizarre to me it's bizarre to me that guys have have gone to this level now you could say yeah but Men were always critical of women's uh, looks, not necessarily, not necessarily the way that people are today. Uh, today, it's, a, uh, it, it's, 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 it's crossed all lines, uh, so much so that I've literally heard men uh, tell their wives that they don't uh, enjoy the way that uh, they uh, conduct themselves in privacy, and uh, therefore uh, they need to work on themselves. Now, why would a man ever say such an awful thing to literally murder his wife in cold blood and think that's going to be conducive to their marriage? I'll tell you why. He has watched so much filthy, disgusting pornography that he has the illusion in his mind that that's how real life is. So everything that his wife will ever do, he compares her to that filthy zona that he watched in a video or the ones that he sees in the street or his past experiences and he's trying to compare a tzaddika to a zona and he says how come you're not like the zona but pretend to be a tzaddika like what does he want he wants his wife to be like bilam he wants his wife to be like bilam bilam was the biggest most wicked person on planet earth but he wanted the death of avram and Yitzhak and yaakov mot yesharim bilam says uh, he wants to have Mot Yesharim, the, the death of the uh, of the straits, which is referring to our forefathers, Avraham, Yitzhak, and Yaakov. He wants a righteous woman, but he wants her to look and act like a zona. This Rabotai Karim shows how far we are from where we need to be. Why? Because a person that understands what is required in a marriage to be successful in a life, in just simply, uh, just Derech Eretz, just courtesy of just a human being that's uh, that's that's obviously connected to hashem looks at this and says are you sure this is a real human being are you sure this is like a real this is a religious person and unfortunately sometimes it is or at least they pretend to be so it's very very important that a person needs to know this first club a man 
that shuts his mouth or a woman that shuts her mouth more often than not typically will have a much better life typically will have a much better life and that's in essence what the Gomi Vilna has given us as footnote number one or advice number one whatever you want to call it he says for every second that a man seals his mouth he merits on that account to bask in the concealed light something which no angel or creature can imagine now of course we're not really seeing the light here where where's the angel where's that we'll get to that in a moment we're just talking about practical uh applications and how it actually applies to your day-to-day life if you know that uh every single time you say something your husband gets angry every single time he says something she gets angry then perhaps it's the uh, maybe you should talk less but yeah but she wants me to talk oh so maybe you should consider what you're going to say before you say it and see oh when i say this he always gets angry when she says this I, he always gets angry so don't say it how about that for a chidush? How about that for Hidush? Don't say it. But no, but I have to. Oh, you have to? Okay, so, you know, have a miserable life. Have a miserable life. I know this sounds ridiculous, Rabotai, but this is really the root of many people's problems. They simply can't shut up. They simply cannot shut up and they need, they feel the need to talk and say a lot of things. And as a talkative person myself, Baruch Hashem, one of the main changes that I applied to my life over the years of getting closer to HaKadosh Baruch Hu is this is all I talk about. I talk to what? Generally speaking, it's very, very little socializing, uh, almost to no, ex- no, no, no non-existence, uh, whether it's with friends or, or, uh, or, or students or my own wife and kids. is virtually we try to have zero small talk that's the goal of life zero small talk zero nonsense if you're going to say something it has to have meaning and usually the things that have meaning have connection to the torah or it is the torah itself and that's really all that's that's important in life now what do i see if it was a chart like i used to look at when i was on wall street it would be a chart that you see continue going higher and improving the situation as I talk less nonsense, my life improves. Anytime I fall and I decide to have Ruach Stut and I decide to say some type of sentence full of nonsense, then you see the chart crash. And you have to fix it, you have to do chuba, and you go back up. This, Rabotai, is one of the greatest things that a person can apply to their life. Now, of course, again, the uh, a little bit of talk, especially with the wife or with the husband, whichever, you know, depending on where you're at, is necessary but not every little bit is necessary not every little bit of necessary not every detail is necessary and needless to say all the friends and uh and the colleagues and so on those are generally not necessary uh but again people think that it's necessary for a person to socialize but that's because they learn this from uh from from the media that you need to socialize so all day if they're not you know watching the news to find out how other people are socializing about other people's lives then they're what they're doing they're just repeating what they saw on the news or some other type of network with people so in essence it goes from people being nosy and looking in places they don't belong and 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 talking about it on the news non-stop and if you didn't hear it once you'll hear it again every single hour for the whole day and then the people that watch as soon as they stop watching they go communicate the very same thing that they saw to other people oh did you see what happened today biden did this this one that that this one died this one's alive this one came back to you know all the, talk, 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 talk. you know who does that parrots parrots people have become parrots and it's sad because you're people if you're parrots and your goal is to become parrots this would be great you've achieved your 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 life's goals but you're not a parrot you're a person why are you acting like a parrot it's a good question i don't have an answer for that maybe people do now, the Gaomi Vilna is saying every single opportunity that a person remembers what he learned today and applies it to their life and stays quiet, they're literally creating an angel. They're creating a, a, a light. They're creating a light that even the angels that are up in heaven that see things that we cannot even imagine, 
even those angels cannot comprehend the magnitude of that light. That's how much greatness a person creates as a result of being quiet when necessary. You'd be surprised. The more quiet you become, the more analytical you become of your speech and the more you realize how much of it is unnecessary. The more quiet you become, the more you realize how much the talking that you used to do is unnecessary. But again, every person needs to understand if you're talking divrei Torah, you can talk to no end. From morning to night, 24 hours a day, 120 years. But if you're talking about other things, that's where the limitations have to come in. Now, the Gaomi Vilna specifies, rather than saying don't talk, he specifies for every single rega, every second, every rega is not really a second, according to the Gemara in uh, Masechet Brachot, it says that the uh, Bil'am, the Rasha, had one power that even Moshe Rabbeinu did not have, which was that he knew the rega, the rega that uh, Hashem is judging the world. And during that time, he can curse anyone and Hashem would bring the, uh, the decree on them because he knew that there's already judgment in the world during that moment. So the Chachamim say, what is a rega? And if you look at the commentary, the, uh, the accepted opinion is that a rega is one fifteenth thousand of a second. That's a rega. And Rashi says a rega is not something that a human being can truly comprehend and, and, and really put into perspective. It's such a little bit amount of time. And here the Gaomi Vilna says every rega virega, meaning every second and second, every moment and moment, every rega that a person stays quiet, it's a very, very big deal. Not only telling a person that you shouldn't do bad things, you shouldn't say stupid things, but rather, even if you're simply a sewer mouth, you have to talk all the time, and what you're going to talk about is not going to be any good, holding yourself back for even a few moments, you'll get a reward for it. You'll get punished for this garbage that you said. But at the very least, if you're able to hold yourself for a few moments, like <clears throat> that few moments, you're going to get a reward for that. That's how gracious HaKadosh Baruch Hu is. That's how important it is to think about what you're going to talk about before you say it. So here we see that the Gaomi Vilna is giving us a little bit of a different perspective on life, which is that the value of a rega, the value of a moment. Value of a moment, Rabotai, is not something that most people uh, really think is, uh, is, uh, would make a difference in life. But uh, truly, if you look into the uh, words of the Chachamim and you uh, study them, you see that a rega can determine the difference between an eternity of good or an eternity of bad. Rabbi again, Allah Shalom, many times I heard him say that it takes 70 years of toil and hard work to earn yourself a place in heaven, but only a rega to lose it all. And the more you understand it, the scarier it becomes because you know it's true. 70 years of working to try to earn yourself a keep for an eternity of good in heaven, in Olam Abba, but a person can chas shalom ruin all of it in a rega, in a minute, second, less than a second, 15,000 of a second. So here we see that the a rega is either endless reward, an action that takes a rega could lead to endless reward, or the opposite chas shalom. One of the Gdolim in the previous generation, the Rav of Yerushalayim, Rav Zelig Ruven Benjis, 
told his family one time that he wants to do a celebration for a siyuma shas, completed the shas. And the family that knew the, uh, the father's study schedule, they didn't know how could this be because they knew exactly when he would complete the shas every so often, and this was not on the schedule. So they asked him, Abba, um, why the change in schedule? He says, no, this is not the same shas that's on the daily limud. This is a different shas. Different shas? When did you learn this shas? He said, every mo- every time I found myself having a five minute, five minutes that I'm going to have to wait for a bleak milata to start or for a wedding or for uh, you know an elevator or a bus, every time I knew that I had five minutes, I would start learning the shas during those five minutes. And an accumulation of all of those five minutes over the years, I've now completed the entire shas bavli. Here we see how much the Chachamim valued each and every single moment, each and every single moment of their life, and took it as something that they not only appreciated, but they utilized it. They utilized it. When one of the Gdole Ado, Rab Naftali Trop, became critically sick. The, uh, the, the students saw that the Rav is not getting better and they took drastic measures and uh, added to their prayers that each and every single person is, in essence, donating a piece of their life to the Rav. And every person, they took this down, they wrote it down, how much do you want to contribute? One guy said, I'm going to donate an hour of my life. Kadosh Baruch take that hour for me and give it to a Rav Trop. Another one said, I'm going to give two hours. Another one said, half hour. Another one said, two days, three days, four weeks, a month, and so on and so forth. They gathered up the nice list, and they came to the Chafetz Chaim. And they asked the Chafetz Chaim, the Gdola Do, and said, for the Rav, we have this campaign. Campaign to accumulate as much life as possible, to give to the Rav, so HaKadosh Baruch will have mercy and give up a part of each of our lives. Bezat Hashem, many more years to teach us Torah. What is the Rav willing to give to Rav Trop? Chavetz Chaim thought about it extensively and then said, Rega. Rega? Okay. Willing to donate? Rega. When a person first hears this, if they're not in line with the significance of our Chachamim, their first impression is, what's going on? Why is the tzaddik so cheap? Only giving a rega, 15,000 of a second? He's not giving it to some rasha, he's giving it to a tzaddik. Why only a rega? But if a person is in line, with the mindset and ideology of the tzaddikim and understands who and what we're talking about here, they actually get an extraordinarily valuable lesson from that answer of how valuable a rega is in the eyes of a chacham because they know how many mitzvot they can learn during that time, fulfill during that time, how much Torah they can fulfill, how much Torah they can learn. And each one of those regas is literally, has an endless value. And the young kids that uh, came to the Chafetz Chaim got an extraordinarily important Musar lesson from the Chafetz Chaim that changed many of their lives, realizing how much you could achieve in a rega. When Rav uh, Leib Chasman was uh, preparing his keilah for the end of Yom Kippur, this was the final Yom Kippur of the Rav, he told his keilah that Rabbi Yonah, that uh, the, the prophet Yonah, in chapter 1, verse 12, 
and Sefer Yona says to the uh, the people on the ship lift me up and cast me into the sea and Rav Chasman asks why did Yonah Navi add the word Seuni lift me up why did he not just say throw me overboard obviously you have to use you know lift somebody up before you throw them over the board but needless to say what was the extra word for and he can't say oh no that's just the way he talks no no this is first of all it's a prophet second of all these are words that are written in the Tanakh there's no extra words why is a Kadosh Baruch Hu feel the need to have these extra words as you would seem to, to see it to have written in the Torah where Yonah is telling the people lift me up and then throw me away throw me overboard of Hasman says because Yonah appreciated the value of life even the f- one final moment of life is extraordinarily valuable and therefore he asked the sailors to take an extra moment to lift him up as that extra lift will delay his death by a moment and therefore he says to his kila if we see the Yunanavi that he himself asked them to throw him overboard because he knew that if they don't throw him over the board into the sea then they're all gonna die anyway why should they die for his sin so he knows this has to happen but why not live for an extra moment if you now valued life so much that he wanted to live that extra moment says Rav Chasman, let us appreciate this valuable lesson and use that last few moments before the end of Yom Kippur and do tshuva what about all you were supposed to do in the last 25 hours now do tshuva now now do tshuva now a person that sees some of the things that Chazal say say you know what okay value being time I see it's relevant but valuing moments hard to relate hard to relate until you see yourself in the story sometimes a person watches Shul Torah and they contact me and they say Rabbi listen I saw you I want to use the story or the thing that you said during the shul I want to say it on my Shulchan Shabbat I say Chazaku Baruch go for it no I want a question about this question about that and I give them the answers that they need even if sometimes the question is not even relevant to what I was talking about still Chazaku Baruch people are going to share our Torah with their uh, family with their friends on Shabbat fantastic nothing better than that now sometimes people tell me listen Rabbi I tried seeing what you said but my family wasn't listening to me they just I don't know I saw they were just looking at me and they really weren't really interested I got really excited about it and I prepared and, and I did everything possible and I finally said it and I don't know they all looked at me like you know yeah okay thank you for finishing look they were excited about me finishing I feel uh, like I'm wasting my time says the Chafetz Chaim to one of his students who came to him with the same exact question he says Kvod Arav, I gave a speech I gave a speech to the Kayla and the Kayla looked at me as if they were looking through me waiting for me to finish I spoke to them for an hour and a half 
and I can see in their eyes that they're counting the seconds before I finish. And when I completed everything, they were more excited about me completing the speech than the words that I say, because the words that I said had no impact. I feel like I rather just learned Torah, and it's worth much more. Says the Chafetz Chaim, that's a mistake. Why it's a mistake? Look at what our teacher, the Gaon Mivyona, has taught us. That for each and every moment that a person seals his mouth, he merits on that account to bask in a concealed light, something which no angel or other creature can imagine. How does this relate to you? It relates to you because for that one hour, for that one hour and a half that you spoke, or for that five minutes that you spoke on your Shulchan Shabbat, people were paying attention. People were not chit-chatting. People were not saying Lashon Ara. People were not talking idle talk that was worthless. They were there quietly, even if not willingly, but out of being cordial and respectful, they stayed quiet for five minutes. Oh, I wish I can have such reward like you, says the Chafetz Chaim. When you had hours upon hours of people not making sins because of you. Oh, what a great reward you have. I wish I had the same. Such light you created. Meaning that even if you think that your Torah speech and your story did not impact people, the fact that they paid attention, or even if they didn't pay attention, but they literally did not commit any sins by simply just be, being quiet, that in itself is an extraordinary reward that you're going to get for. Needless to say, if you actually do give them chizuk and get them to do tshuva and get them close to Hashem. But even if you don't, even if you literally say things that just go over their heads, they don't understand a single word that you say, it's still praiseworthy. It's still good. Chazak baruch, you're doing good. You're doing good. Why? They didn't sin for that five minutes. They didn't sin for that one hour. Needless to say, if it's on Shabbat, on Shabbat people get together, and in, you know many times if they're not a Torah-based home, then uh, what happens? And by Torah-based home, I don't mean religious. Torah-based home means that people are learning Torah every day, even if they're working, even if they're making millions, it doesn't make a difference. But they're learning Torah every single day. If they're a Torah-based home, then on Shabbat everybody shares the Torah. The father, the son, the this, the that, even uh, the kids. Share the Torah. Everybody talks Torah. What's the parasha? What's this? What are you learning? What's this? What's everything is connected to Torah. But when it's not a Torah-based home, then what does everybody do? Everybody brings to their Shabbat table the laundry of the entire neighborhood for the entire week. Oh, did you hear what happened there? Three houses next door. Yeah, I think he divorced her. Oh, did you hear what happened there? The rabbi says that uh, he's okay for not giving her a get. Oh, did you hear what happened there? He's taking him to Bedin. Oh, did you hear what happened over there? They got into an accident. Oh, did you hear what happened over there? I think he's sick. And everybody brings everybody's laundry to the Shulchan Shabbat, and then there's a surprise, the disaster strikes. So, says the Chafetz Chaim, you know that your house is full of this junk. Everybody's bringing their garbage pail to the Shulchan Shabbat. And you... Have five minutes of Torah in you. Five minutes, not more. You heard a shiu, and you have five minutes that you remember. Go and say those five minutes. Tell them that sipu, that story about the Baal Shem Tov. Tell them that story about the Chazonish. Tell them that story that you heard in a shiu Torah by Rabbi Reuven. Tell them one of those stories. Tell them. Why? Because for those five minutes, they will not make sense. That is extraordinary because it's not only that you yourself did not make sense, but now on your account, every single one of them did not make sense for five minutes. Oh, how praiseworthy you are. I wish I had your share, says the Chafetz Chaim. A person understands the magnitude of the words of the Chafetz Chaim and meaning the Gaon Mifilna, understands how valuable a rega really is. And the Chafetz Chaim says in the Chovata uh, Ashmira, in chapter 6, that a person that guards their tongue 
is using the most effective cure for all illnesses that a person can have you have a physical problem your body hurts your head hurts whatever body part some type of illness that you have Chafetz Chaim signs off his name you want a cure be quiet be quiet how much as much as possible how much as much as possible if it's not Torah don't talk that's the best cure that's like cure for cancer that's how great it can be now of course the person says, oh it's a, I'm gonna try I'm gonna do it and you know three minutes later they fail and not only they fail they start saying nonsense so a person needs to understand the ramifications of talking nonsense we cannot just say that something is good we cannot even just say that you will get a reward for it because the most inspiring tool that a kadosh Bahu put into creation is fear and a person is inspired by fear more than he is than by anything else fear of loneliness fear of poverty fear of hunger fear of punishment of other kinds there's all types of fears that a person has the only fear that is permissible is the fear of the almighty but that does not come to us naturally and rabbi salami salan says that's the one fear that you have to work your whole life on acquiring everything else in reality is forbidden but nonetheless if a person fears speaking idle words speaking things that are not just wrong but simply a waste of time that person is going to have the pasuk of who is a man who desires life and loves days be fulfilled they'll have a longer life they'll have a better life now the Gaumi Vilna continues and says guard your tongue from evil and your lips from speaking deceitfully now a person that is clueless we have to explain to them in the practical terms of this world as I said in the beginning of this you if you see that you are having marriage problems you're having all types of problems at work it's usually because of things that you're saying it's usually because of your the way that you communicate and unfortunately that is the root of many problems if you can find it in yourself uh, enough love for yourself that you'll keep yourself quiet you'll see that your life becomes better you'll see that your life becomes better now if you can't find it in yourself to keep yourself quiet then don't come complaining now but we still want to help you so we have to give you the other aspects of things the Gaumi Vilna says the following in this letter the Gaumi Vilna says this being quiet is not just get you a good reward get you to have a better marriage perhaps even a promotion at work not just that by being quiet this will atone for every sin and save a person from Genom Shaul Tachtit is another name for Genom it's actually the seventh level of Genom seventh chamber of Genom this will atone for every sin and save one from Genom as we find in Mishle, Proverbs chapter 21, verse 23, he who guards his mouth and his tongue guards his soul from troubles. Now, if it's just talking about speech, why does it say he guards his mouth and his tongue? So Zachamim come and say, ah. It says guards his mouth from eating and drinking things that they shouldn't be. Either it's too much or it's forbidden foods. And guarding his tongue from idle words, needless to say, from forbidden words. 
rumors, all types of things. In the last couple of days, a few people contacted, said, listen, Rabbi, can you tell me who is the victims that you're uh, talking to uh, from this Amanov uh, and uh, missionary uh, partnership uh, debacle? I'm sorry, I can't tell you. No, no, but this is my community. I want to know. I'm sorry, I can't tell you. Why not? I'm, I'm, I'm friends with everybody. I know everybody. Good. It's, if it's not you, I can't tell you. Meaning, if you are the victim, I'll tell you you're the victim. But if it's not you, I can't talk about it. can't tell you names. Why? But it's all one big family. I'm sorry, I can't. Why can't you? Because I don't want to go to Gainon. That's why I can't. I don't want to go to Gainon. Explain to you that it's Lashon Explain to you that it's Rechilud. Explain to you that it's idle words. Explain to you that all types of other t- different types of speech violations. It's obviously, it's a, it's, a, it's a moot point. Simple. I don't want to go to Gainon. That's why I'm not going to tell you the things that I don't need to tell you. I'll tell you the things you need to know, which is the general problem that hopefully people will wake up and create enough noise to eliminate the problem and get these people to run away and, and go, I don't know, put themselves in some cave and never come out. But as far as all of the extra juicy details that you're asking for, I simply cannot give it to you. Why? I don't want to go to Gainom. Because the Gaomi Vilna says, if I don't guard my mouth, I'm going to go to Gainom, and I don't want to go to Gainom. No, but Rabbi, I'm not even talking about Lashon I'm talking about just, uh, you know, let's just talk between, you know, friends. Oh, so idle talk. I don't want to go to Kafakela. But you just said Gainom. Yeah, there's Gainom, there's Kafakela, there's different departments for different speech. Different parts for different speech. Says the Gemara in Masechet Shabbat, page 152b. A person that makes certain types of sins, such as Lashonara, goes to Kafakila, asks the Gemara, what is Kafakila? Kafakela is a very special department that HaKadosh Baruch Hu created, where he has these angels that are angels of destruction. And they take the soul and slingshot it from one end of the universe to the other end of the universe while doing a few flips and tricks and beatings to that soul throughout the whole way so it doesn't forget them. It's not a roller coaster of fun, but rather a disaster. And in fact, it's not even something that atones for sins. It's pure and utter revenge for a person going against the king that created him. A person that watched our shoe about Kafakila understands it's not a joke. It's not a joke, it's not a laughing matter, but in fact, most people don't even think it exists. Needless to say, there are many reshaim that say it doesn't exist or it's just parables, all types of other mumbo-jumbo nonsense. Even though there are verses in the Torah to discuss this. You have the uh, Abigail says to David Melech in the book of Samuel, chapter 25, verse 29, that the wicked that spoke against him, they're going to go to Kafakela. Ask the Gemara, what's this Kafakela? This Kafakela is a very special place where HaKadosh Baruch Hu punishes certain people that went against this Torah with specific types of sins. And in the shiur that we made about Kafakela, we gave you the details of the different types of Kafakela because it's not all the same. At the beginning of the uh, the uh, Igeret Agra, the Gaomi Vilna warned his wife not to speak idle words. Why? Because idle words are in itself a sin that can bring a person to kafakela but now we also have forbidden words which is much worse much worse hence the reason of why the gaomi vilna is talking about saving yourself from genom why because it could be this it could be that it could be both how could it be both if you look at a sefer that was written about 400 years ago called yalkut chadash from Rabbi Israel Mibelz. In Ot Tet, he says that 
there is a certain type of sinner that gets a unique punishment what is this unique punishment this unique punishment it goes to a person that says lashonara or a person that made a mitzvah like he gave tzedakah but then he regretted it he made a mitzvah like he went to pray but because he missed his flight he regretted praying he made a mitzvah and he went to a shiur torah but because his friends didn't like the shiur and it was a good solid shiur it's just that his friends are heretics he regretted going to the shiur or because he missed the basketball game because of it he regretted the shiur so he regrets the mitzvah says rabbi israel mibel 400 years ago such a person that says lashonara or regrets a mitzvah there is no lower level of punishment than such a person who then gets reincarnated into a stone and that stone is placed inside gehenna and is flung around flung around inside gehenna as they do in kafakela meaning this is a kafakela inside genom how long is the tikkun for this stone i.e for this person until the stone melts from the fire that surrounds it meaning a agony that is incomprehensible an agony and pain that's incomprehensible what happens to a person that speaks Lashonara or regrets mitzvot? And the verses that he uses to uh, to uh, bring this from is from Psalms, chapter 84, verse 7, that we say every single day in our prayer. That they, uh, they uh, pass through the valley of Bacha. Bacha means crying, tears. And the, the Rav here gives us a warning that is explains what the Gaon Mivilna says in the beginning of the letter and in the letter now. Earlier in the letter, he said, don't speak idle words because you'll go to Kafakela. Today, he says, be quiet because being quiet will save you from Geinom. So why Kafakela and Geinom? Because it could be either Kafakela or genom or both that's it now rabotai if that's not enough the gaomi vilna says another verse death and life are in the power of the tongue and woe to the person that kills himself for one ill-conceived word one ill-conceived word one word you said to the rabbi inappropriately one word you said inappropriately to Talmud Chacham one word inappropriately you said to your wife to your husband to your child many parents think that just because they have children it's like a free-for-all they're allowed to embarrass them in public you embarrass your kids in public you're gonna get punished for it in fact if you embarrass them for no reason you'll get punished for it even if it's private people think oh he's my kid I can do whatever I want no you can't no, you can't. You can't just decide to embarrass your kid just because you feel like it. Of course, there's chinuch, there's proper chinuch, or teachers. Teachers, I remember from my day, if you got in trouble, you did something. Teacher will keep you after class and write this. I will never do this again a thousand times. And you go there and you write, you write, 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 and you don't finish. Okay, you have to do it again in front of the whole class. Right, right, right. That's not chinuch. That teacher will get punished for it. Why? Because the only thing that the kid learns from such from such punishment is that their hands hurt. That's it. That's all they learn. Their hands hurt after they write a lot. So people think that they could just simply say whatever they want, do whatever they want, and the Gaumi Vilna tells us there's a price for everything. There's a very, very serious price for everything. So much so that a person can literally kill themselves because of a single word. What is killing themselves? If they understood the magnitude of their speech. If they understood the magnitude of their speech, 
they would understand why the speech is killing them. In the Zohar Kadosh, Parashat B'Shalach, page 59a, talks about the value of a single word. The value of a single word, the not even a word, but rather the air that comes out of a person's mouth. The Zohar asks, we see that in Kafakela, there's a slingshot. For all these sinners, their neshamot get flung like a stone. Sometimes they uh, are incarnated in a stone, so it's, it's a painful experience. Where is all this? Where's the fuel for all this? Chachamim ask all types of questions, logistical questions. How does this happen? How does that happen? What's the fuel for this? They want to know. Legitimate questions that average person wouldn't ask. Why would you even care? Where's the fuel come? I care because I want to know the mechanics, number one. Number two, maybe I can fix something and not give it the fuel. If there's no fuel, there's no fire. Even the best car in the world requires fuel. So if there's no fuel, there's no fire. What gives Kafakela the fuel? These angels are flinging it. Yeah, but what gives them the fuel? Says the Zohar Kadosh in Parashat B'Shalach, page 59a. We see from the verses that the person that sins, person that sins by saying Lashon it's hevel piv. It's things, it's words of idleness. Nonsense that they're saying. That hevel, that air, if you will, that nothing that comes out of their mouth right before they say the bad things, that creates an angel. And that angel, the name of it is hevel. And that evil that's created is the one that's going to slingshot that person's soul in Kafakela. And roll the, roll the soul around the world. And then all of those actions that the person did that we're not serving Hashem, give that angel Hevel, not only create him, but give that angel Hevel more strength to exist and exert even more spiritual power in the sling, in the flinging of the soul up and down and rolled around the world as it was hinted by Shlomo HaMelech in Ecclesiastes chapter 1 verse 14 Ra'iti et kol ha-ma'asim shenehesu tachat ha-shemesh v'hine ha-kol hevel v'raot ruach I've seen all the deeds done beneath the sun and behold all is futile and a vexation of the spirit futile is hevel Therefore, what Shlomo HaMelech was referring to, that all of this futile was the vexation of the spirit, this futile, this hevel, is what's going to sling the spirit in Kafakela. And it also says in the Zohar, Au Mila De Avid, which is... Um, it's from the same thing that uh, he created. Mila is what he created. He created a a uh, davar, a mila. Mila is a word. So from that same word that he created, the Gaume Vilna says that idle word is what's going to give that person not only the, the kafakela, but gives that kafakela a certain amount of strength. The more nonsense they speak, the more significant the punishment is going to be even further the balatanya the foundation of chabad anyone that has the audacity to call themselves a chabadnik needs to know what i just i'm about to say like the back of their hand 
The Baal Tanin Likutei Amarim in the eighth Perek says, and he elaborates on this. He says, as for permissible but idle chatter, talking nonsense in so many words, such as in the case of an ignoramus who cannot study Torah, he must undergo the cleansing of his soul to rid himself from the tum'ah of the klipa that he created from the nonsense that he says, because each time a person says idle words, male or female, they are creating a klipa, a shell around their soul. That shell must be broken. How do you break a shell? You hit it like a rock. You hit it. So that shell has to be broken. How? By being rolled through kafakela. As it's stated in the Zohar that we already quoted, same thing as what the Tanya is quoting in Pashat Beshalach, page 59a. In so many words, Rabotai, the cost of speaking nonsense we're not even talking about speaking really bad things, false rumors, lashonara. Simply speaking nonsense has a very, very big price. Speaking things that are forbidden, obviously the magnitude of the sin is even worse. The magnitude of the sin is even worse. But what can we do that sometimes there are people that are addicted to talking? Addicted to talking. They can't stop talking. But not talking things of wisdom. Rather talking nonsense. Pure and utter nonsense. Where no one that's outside of their circle of crazy people will understand them. And even the people within their circle of people usually don't understand them. But if they speak with big words, people pretend like they understand what they're talking about. So either... It's crazy people think they, uh, they, they speak to each other. Or it's simply people are too ashamed to admit that they have no idea what you're talking about. You'll find this very often in missionary circles, people that are heretics, people that are anti-Torah, lefty liberals, people that pretend to be good, but really in reality they're idol worshippers. Uh, you'll, you'll see this a lot in the uh, socialite world. A lot of things like that are, are very common. And... You'll see that people love to hear themselves talk. Other people are waiting for the opportunity to talk themselves or they want to seem like they're smart and they're nodding and agreeing with everything even though they have no idea what this person is talking about. And there are some people that just love to hear themselves talk. And it's a, unfortunately, a very, very horrendous disease where you'll see certain people just talking 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 but they're not saying much they're not saying much they're just going to tell you the same thing in 15 different ways and it was not it was enough to even have it in one way and even too much when you heard it the first time but they want to repeat it every time you see them they want to tell you about the directions they took to get to your uh, bank, to get to your house, to get to your office. They took the uh, I-95, but then they decided to go on a turnpike, and they got gas on the way, and then somebody called them, but it was the wrong number. And I'll tell you a bunch of things that, in reality, don't really mean anything. Don't really mean anything. This is also, people sometimes get offended when they ask me for a phone call, and I tell them, I don't take calls anymore. I haven't taken calls in a few years, I generally don't take calls. Very rarely will you ever find me on the phone, and typically it's either an emergency or a special case. Generally speaking, I don't take calls. Why? Because when people are, speak on the phone, they feel perfect freedom to just waste your time and talk about everything in the world that doesn't matter. Everything in the world doesn't matter. Whereas when people send you a text message or a voice note, typically they have enough uh, decency to keep it to the point. But when you talk to people, when you meet with people, when you, uh, you, you, you see people, they'll tell you about all types of things that really mean nothing. Mean absolutely nothing. Oh, where do you guys do this weekend? Where are you going next weekend? Oh, what's, uh, what kind of jacket is that? Oh, I like that tie. Oh, how long are you guys married? Like, who cares? 
I never understood those conversations, but people do it. Why? Because they're addicted to talking. And they're addicted to talking. Now, if you told that guy, listen, would you rather hear the things I want to say or go smash your head against the wall 15 times? Nine out of 10 people will go smash their head against the wall. Why? Because they really don't want to hear you talk. But since they themselves are addicted to talking and they know that the only way they get to talk is if they give you a turn to talk, they say, okay, listen, I'll go through it. Yeah, go, 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 go say whatever nonsense you want to say. And then I'll get, I'll have my turn. I'll say my nonsense. You'll say your nonsense. And before you know it, we'll both be on back on the highway, creating more nonsense to talk about when we get to the next appointment. And that's most people's lives is this nonsense. You see this on the news. You see this in the, uh, in all types of media. You see it in the papers. You see it in books. You see that the books of, of, of today, generally speaking, you'll see an entire book could be a thousand pages. The whole story could have fit in 15 pages. So what's the extra 985 pages? Simple. You wouldn't pay 20 bucks for a 15 page book. You wouldn't pay for a 20 bucks 15 page book. So they have to put a lot of fluff. Same thing with uh, with the news. An hour and a half they're talking about same mumbo jumbo that could take 30 seconds. And generally speaking, most news is not relevant to the viewers that are watching it. Whether it's the stock market news or it's all types of financial news, or all types of governmental news. To the average viewer, it does not matter. You can't do anything about it. You don't even understand it. And in reality, it's it, it's not even uh, it's not even consequential or affecting your life in any way. But unfortunately, people are addicted to this stuff. They're addicted to this stuff because they want more stuff, more content to talk about, and sound educated. So you'll see. Very often, the people that try to pretend like they are the thinking men, like this Rasha missionary called Clavin, he calls himself the thinking man. He thinks he's like the Aristotle of the generation or something. He's the thinking man. So the common denominator among these thinking men, name dropping. Name dropping. They'll name you all types of uh, big people that were before them, famous people, some people nobody even ever heard of, some people people did speak of. But either way, when you say somebody's name, oh, that means you are well read. No, it just means you wasted a lot of time memorizing names. That's really all it means. And no one's going to double check if you actually read what you're saying you read and if what you're saying actually was said by the guy that you said you read his, his work. But the name dropping goes... And then they tell you all types of people that they know and places that they went to. Like, who cares that you read this or you went there? Tell me the bottom line, Tachlis. What's the point? What can I learn from it? And if they even have an idea to begin with, generally speaking, that entire idea could be summed up in maybe 25 seconds. And if the guy's really intelligent, a minute and a half. Why? Because generally speaking, secular knowledge is empty. It's empty. There's not much substance to it. So you don't need many words to express it, to deliver the words. And and, and many times people are just so addicted to speaking that they'll just say the same thing over and over and over again without any thought whatsoever of whether this should be cut or not or and that's what happens. So the addiction to speaking is something that I would say most people have, unless they're uh, very self-conscious people or introverts and don't talk at all. And this is something that a person should be conscious of. Why? Because those extra words that you're using have a price. They have a price. It, that price is either a golden ticket golden ticket for your heaven because it's good and valuable words that uh that will help people get closer to hashem or it's simply nothing idle words and you're in essence creating more fuel for your own punishment that's choice number one choice number two or 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 condition number two i should say is people that simply can't move on what is that the uh, Rav Galinsky said that he was once on a train. And on this train, he was trying to get some rest. The, uh, all the different 
journeys and battles that he would fight. Uh, he needed to get some rest, but the guy next to him was some Gentile that simply could not stop repeating the same thing, which is, I'm so thirsty. I'm so thirsty. Oof, I'm thirsty. Thirsty, thirsty, thirsty. I'm so thirsty. And he would just repeat it over and over and over again. Now, aside from the fact that Rav Galinsky has Derech Eretz, he's, uh, he's also a very small person. So slapping the guy in the mouth, like we all want to do, uh, is not gonna, it's not an option for him. So you have to hear this. And he can't rest because the other guy just keeps talking out loud about how thirsty he is. As soon as the train stopped, Rav Galinsky runs out of the train, hurries up to go get some water, which wasn't as easily accessible as it is today, and makes it right back to the train before it leaves the station and goes to the next one and gives the guy the water. He would think, ah, Tzadik, problem solved, good for you, great story. But it wouldn't be a story if that was the case. Why? He gave him the, st- he gave him the drink. The Gentile drank the water and then continued saying, wow, I was so thirsty. I can't believe I was so thirsty. You know, sometimes you get thirsty. I was so thirsty. Really, really so thirsty. Says Arouz Gavlinsky, sometimes there's certain people that simply can't move on. They can't move on. They just can't move on past the point that they're stuck at. I have certain people that I've, I've been talking to and they literally have been at the same exact point as what they were when I first started talking to them a year ago, five years ago, 10 years ago, 20 years ago. And that's actually one of the greatest things that you see as a Baal Tshuva that comes from a uh, non-religious background, non-religious friends, uh, non-religious community, a non-religious world. One of the greatest things that you'll see along the way, it doesn't happen right away, because when you first start doing Tshuva, most of the time people call you crazy or they simply ask you who died you know you decide to keep shabbat you put a keep on ask you oh who is saying kaddish for who died like why are you religious like people think that someone needs to die in order for people to become religious apparently judaism has bad marketing so people think this way now when you first start doing tshuva most of your friends siblings and so on will tell you either that you're crazy uh or uh, or they're just not really understanding what you're doing and they think perhaps it's a phase that you're going through like a midlife crisis equivalent now all of those people will generally speaking let you do what it is that you're doing and without really bothering you but there are of course always messengers of the satan sometimes they're your brothers or your sisters or your parents or your spouse even uh but nonetheless or your co-workers or boss and they try to discourage you. They try to tell you, don't do it. You're crazy. This is too much. Take it slow. One mitzvah every 10 years, or maybe at least one every seven years, like the Shemitah. You know, this year you'll, ke- you'll, you'll keep Kashut. In seven years, you'll keep Shabbat. In seven years from there, maybe ha- perhaps you'll keep Tarat Mishpacha. Before you know it, by the time you die, you'll keep 10 mitzvot and go to Gehenom. But... They don't realize the magnitude of things. They don't realize reward and punishment is not a uh, suggestion or an idea or a theory, but rather a reality, both in this world and the next. So they try to discourage you because watching you do tshuva, getting closer to Hashem, is in essence reminding themselves that they're staying in the same place. So they try to discourage you. And if, and Bezat Hashem, when, you overcome that obstacle and you continue running, running forward, taking on everything you possibly can. Don't listen to those fools that say, oh, listen, slowly, slowly, just keep half of Shabbat, just eat kosher in the house one day. Don't listen to people like that. Whatever you know, do it. Whatever you know, do it. If you can do it, do it. Don't think, oh no, if I keep half Shabbat, it's good. It's not good. You're going to get home. 
either keep Shabbat or you go to Gehenom. There's no half Shabbat. There's no one minute Shabbat. There's no once a year Shabbat. You keep Shabbat all the time, you go to heaven. You don't keep Shabbat, you go to Gehenom. Simple. Anyone that tells you otherwise is a liar or clueless or both. But the reality is a lot of people say slowly, slowly, slowly. Now, you should run. Why you should run? Because if you run, you'll have a lot of a chizuk from Shemaim. That momentum will keep you going. And before you know it, a year will pass. And if you compare yourself from one year to the next, you'll see some drastic changes. Changes in your understanding. Changes in your perception. Changes sometimes even in your looks. Now, don't worry. Those changes will continue. Two years out, you'll see even more drastic changes. Not just drastic changes from year two to the beginning, but rather drastic changes from year two to year one. How much you've changed. Even more looks, even more understanding, even more clarity, even more knowledge. Then you go to year three. Drastic changes. How much changes could it be? Endless changes. That's really what's supposed to be. Endless changes. Every year you're supposed to change and improve. Why? More understanding. More Torah. Character trait development. You're better at this. You found out that you're worse at that. And so on and so forth. Now, once you're already on that train and you're in it three, four, five, six years, you'll notice something else. You'll notice something else that perhaps you didn't really notice or pay mind to during the first two, three, four years. What will you notice? After you're in it, I would say for at least five years, perhaps maybe even more for some people, you'll notice something significant. That out of your entire circle of the people that you knew and know, your family, your friends, your colleagues, whoever, all of those people that have not done tshuva are exactly where they were five years ago or worse and you are the only one that progressed in their life they are still dealing with the same or worse life that they had five years ago you have progressed milestones where those very same people that were trying to get you to stop and not do it in some cases are starting to come back to you and ask you for a blessing ask you for advice ask you for guidance not always and not all the time but nonetheless they start coming as you progress even further six seven eight ten years and further you'll see some more of those people if they're still in your circle and still come back and they humble themselves to realize that they're losers and you're not and you'll see that it doesn't matter how long the time frame is it could be five years it could be ten years it could be a thousand years those people that did not do tshuva literally their lives stayed either the same miserable life that they had empty purposeless and and simply full of problems marriage problems child problems money problems everything's a problem or they got worse so he was fighting with with his wife when you first started doing tshuva five years progressed you've done tshuva you got married you already had two kids he either got divorced or he still talks about how much he hates his wife he can't stand her he's this he's that same thing nothing changed nothing changed same thing with business the guy was a cheater liar filth of the earth doing everything he possibly can but figure he's gonna get ahead you progressed five years you have a normal job you're learning you're doing whatever it is that you're doing you're making ends meet sometimes you need a miracle sometimes it's an open miracle sometimes it's a closed miracle but either way you're living you know where panasa comes from anyway you're not worried because you're connected to HaKadosh Baruch Hu, the source of all good him five years have passed either he lost everything because he finally got caught uh empty-handed or he's still doing the same con man acts cheating people lying to people still you know struggling to to make ends meet it doesn't matter that he's now making a hundred thousand a month because he still doesn't have any money at all it doesn't matter that his company has 50 employees because all the employees can't stand him and they're all thinking that the company's going out of business any minute and literally nothing has changed 
Nothing has changed. It only deteriorates at best. It's it just does not get better. And everybody's like that. The marriage is still bad. The relationships are still bad. And it's more like they see you as like, how did you do that? How did you just like slingshot yourself forward? And we're still in the same garbage pail that we're in. Now, most people are not going to admit it. Most people think, oh, yeah, no, listen, he got lucky. She got lucky. Yeah, you know, you had it coming. No, you had this, you had that. No, give all the excuses in the world. It's no excuse, Abutai. It's simply a Kadosh Baruch Hu blesses those that love him and curses those that don't. That's what happens. And the most people don't understand that the these types of things are just a small, small token of the blessing that a person that Hashem gives to a person that trusts in a Kadosh Baruch Hu. Why? Because one of the um, things that uh, the Gemara in Masechet Chagiga says that the righteous will get as a reward is to see the ashes of all of the wicked people under their feet the ashes of all the wicked people are under their feet i heard rab mizrahi shikhe elaborate on that point he says why would you want to see the ashes of the wicked people if you're a righteous person why would you want to see the ashes of the wicked people under your feet i mean if you're in gan eden you're in heaven you want to learn Torah, enjoy eternity, eternity of good. You're enjoying the Shekhinah. I mean, why do you care of what the wicked are doing? He says, no. Part of the reward that HaKadosh Baruch Hu gives the righteous is the constant reminder of what would have happened to you had you not done tshuva. You would be the ashes. Now, when you're constantly, constantly reminded of what it could have been and how you really are, where you are in a better position, the value of your reward is infinitely greater because you're realizing what the other option was. There was no middle ground. So one of the things that HaKadosh Baruch Hu gives the righteous, even in this world, that do tshuva, serious tshuva, is he shows you in real time, in real time, if you have patience and enough dedication, how you're progressing you got married when no one else thought you were going to get married you had kids when no one thought that you were even able to have kids you have panasa you have this you have progress you've moved on with your life and they are still in the same lonely miserable garbage pail they were in 10 years ago nothing has changed and if anything they're just uglier now and fatter now and more miserable now that's it nothing positive has happened he said, yeah, but some guys made a lot of money during the last 10 years. doesn't mean anything. And the more you know those people, the more they'll tell you how that extra money they have means even less than they thought before they had it. Why? Because they're even more miserable as a result of more success. They're even more empty as a result of having all of these different things. And that's in essence what the Gaon Vilna is trying to tell us. If, if, we are going to stick to HaKadosh Baruch Hu. It's not just about keeping mitzvot, but also running away from sins. Running away from sins begins with your eyes, what you look at, where you look, all of the different things, but also you have the speech. You have the speech. What words do you choose to use? How do you describe certain things? How do you express yourself? When do you talk? When are you quiet? Who do you talk to? Why do you talk to them? And what do you talk to them about? All of these things have a significance and have a very, very steep price. Very steep price. Some people are addicted to talking nonsense and they'll get punished for it both in this world and the next. Some people are simply addicted to their current status. They just cannot move forward. The guy told me that he's looking for a job six years ago. Today, he tells me, Rabbi, I'm, I'm, I'm looking for a job. Wait, are you telling me that in six years, no one, was, no one was willing to hire you and you're expecting me to believe that? If you lived, I don't know, in a jungle somewhere, maybe the lions and I don't know, the anacondas over there don't want to hire a human being. I would understand it. But if you live in America, in Europe, 
in developed economies during a economic boom regardless of whether it's real or it's a bubble is irrelevant and you're telling me you can't find a job no 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 habibi there's a problem here there's a very serious problem you were looking for a job five years ago you're still looking for a job you were looking for a wife five years ago you're still looking for a wife you will look ah life doesn't work that way Hashem is hiding his face from you Hashem is hiding his face from you you should be asking not why don't I have a job why don't I have a zivug you should be asking why is a kadosh Baruch Hu hiding himself from me what am I doing wrong what can I do better what can I do better but sometimes people are too focused on the superficial nonsense that they think is the world the illusion of the world the matrix of the world if you will and they missed the whole point they missed the whole point the guy got the drink he complained about for a half hour and instead of moving forward he can't he's just talking about being thirsty but you're satiated yeah but I was thirsty and yes this will drive a normal person insane and guess what most people are insane most people are insane because they can't move on they can't move on the breakup happened five six seven ten years ago fine it was a terrible breakup he cheated on you she cheated on you terrible people he's bad you're bad it's over finish ten years ago move on he moved on you should move on she moved on you should move on stop imagining that you're going to come back to each other it's not going to happen it's gone finished go they fired you already look for a new job it's just go on with life no I'm gonna make a point I'm going to stay this way I'm gonna win this Rabotai, the root of it the root of it comes from ego of believing that the world is supposed to run according to your tune it's a very very sad state for a human being and only they can actually get themselves out of it and typically it requires some type of traumatic experience unfortunately that's the second thing second type of speech that a person has to be careful of of simply not the type of speech that there's no progress in it whatsoever no progress they're not willing to move forward the third one obviously is the most common one that people like to talk about but most people don't really know the meaning of which is Lashonara Lashonara Rabotei Karim is not something that uh the average person understands because they think the Lashonara has to be uh false information not true Lashonara is real Lashonara is true oh Lashonara has to be uh unfavorable not necessarily not necessarily why if you tell people certain things that even if they're favorable on somebody else it could be considered as Lashonara. how so the Gemara in Masechet Bav Metzia or Bav Batra page 164b one of the people says I see you have uh beautiful handwriting how you wrote this oh no 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 it's not me he 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 has uh, beautiful handwriting the other guy he was here yeah he, he's the one that has really really nice handwriting he wrote it Ham says to him, oh that's Lashonara that's Lashonara why wow, I say it's beautiful handwriting yeah that's Lashonara why is Lashonara so they go back and forth and they say or oh, explain it in, in such a way where if you say he has beautiful handwriting he's not here he left and this must have been written by him because he and he's the one that has beautiful handwriting you think oh I'm complimenting him it's a nice thing Chacham says listen if you say his beautiful handwriting perhaps the other guy's gonna think why does he have beautiful handwriting it's probably because when he was a kid he was a bad kid and they used to punish him a lot and make him write everything on the board a million times and because he wrote after writing everything a million times because he's such a bad kid oh he developed good handwriting and he could develop into something ugly now as far as Allah I mean according to the Rambam and the uh and the, and the uh uh Chafetz Chaim say just saying he has hand uh, nice handwriting or something good by in itself is not enough to 
be Lashon HaRa, unless you embellish it, meaning you say, he not only has nice handwriting, he has the best handwriting. Not only is he financial off, he's a multi-millionaire. That's Lashon HaRa. If you just say, listen, he's okay, he has the basic things, if it's necessary to some extent, not always Lashon HaRa. But to go and tell people uh, things that are with embellishment, again, true, but with, with embellishment, oh, he's really rich, he's really successful, he's the best, that can be decreed as Lashon HaRa. Why? If he's really successful and somebody says to you, listen, you know, uh, Steve? Yeah, yeah, Steve. Yeah. What do you mean, Steve? Steve with the Porsche? I don't know if he has a Porsche. Ah, well, he also has a Ferrari. I don't know if he has a Ferrari. You know, Steve with the big house, that three, four, five million dollar house up the block? I'm not sure. Greenbaum? Yeah, yeah, Steve Greenbaum. Yeah, so he has a four million dollar house, a Ferrari, a Porsche, a dish, a stock portfolio. You give him the entire guy's bank account. Guess what? Every single word that came out of your mouth, Lashon Ara. Why? Maybe Steve doesn't want everybody to know he has all these things. And you say, wait, but if he doesn't want people to know that he has a multi-million dollar house, don't buy one. Buy a cave. Go uh, live in the mountains. No. It's not your business to share it. If he chooses to share it and live there, that's one thing. But for you to share it, it's a completely different thing. That's number one. Number two, once you tell people, oh, Steve is rich, maybe those people are going to say, you know what? If Steve's rich, maybe I'm going to call him and ask him for a loan. And maybe Steve doesn't want to lend money. Oh, if Steve's rich, maybe I'm going to go to him and tell him, listen, I have this uh, this wedding, I can't really pay for it, and this and that, and put him on the spot, show up at his job. Listen, Steve, I know this office you have here is simple, but I know where you live. Joe told me, you live in that $5 million house, you have a Ferrari, and what is it, a Porsche? Yeah, it's a new one. Yeah, 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 I know, he told me. That's Lashon Ara. And for Lashon Ara, there's a special genome for it. And some say it's a mix. Genom, kafekela, one batch. It's like a omelet, shakshuka, combo. Why? Gomi Vilna says, you did not like life enough to watch your speech. When a person likes his life, he watches his speech. Where do we see all of this in the Torah Rabotai? Of course, HaKadosh Baruch Hu in his ultimate mercy makes us look like Chachamim. But he has it in this week's parasha, Ishtabach Shimonad. This week's parasha, parashat Chaye Sarah. Chaye Sarah, Sarah, Imenu, left this world, goes to Olam Abba. Avraham lives many years more than her, even though she was a greater prophet than him. And Avraham, it says here in the uh, uh, chapter 23 of Genesis, First few verses, you go to verse number, uh, uh, verse uh, 2. V'tamat Sarah b'kriyat arba, i chevron b'eret knan, v'yavo Avraham l'ispod l'sara v'livkota. Says Sarah died in kriyat arba, that's the place, which is chevron, in the land of Knan, and Avraham came to eulogize Sarah and bewail her, bewail her, livkota. Now, Chamim say, if you look at the Sefer Torah, and they typically do this also in the Chumashim, the way that the Hebrew word Lifkota is written is unusual, where the size of the letter Chaf inside the word Lifkota is unusually smaller than the rest of the letters. And it's not a printing error. It's every Sefer Torah has a small chaf. Every chumash typically that has the, uh, the, uh, this modern day chumash and even the older day chumash have this small chaf. Meaning it is a significant teacher. There's some reason why HaKadosh Baruch Hu told us to write this chaf in small. And Chachamim say that's because it's trying to teach us that the crying that Avraham had over Sarah was smaller than you would think. Smaller than you would think. Some are going to say, oh, the Kliyakal, for example, uh, is, 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 has a uh, um, 
commentary on it saying that Avram was eulogizing his wife it's a uh, emphasizing the noble traits of his wife then Rav her says here it's a small chaf this bewailing that we're talking about it's a small chaf because he's uh he uh the, the crying that he did outside was not much most of his uh mourning was in privacy because your mourning should be in private but then comes the Zohar and some of the Midrashim all say the same say it's because Sarah Sarah he didn't cry much for her why he didn't cry much for her because Sarah made a mistake where did she make a mistake in Parashat Lech Lecha Sarah got upset with Avraham when she saw that he had a baby with Hagar relatively quickly after they got married and she says to to Avraham that perhaps you were praying to have a child but you were not praying for me to have a child because see you got blessed with a child but I'm still childless so she says to uh, Avraham in chapter 16 uh, verse 5 she rebukes uh, Avraham. There's an argument between them. Sarai says to Avraham, The outrage against me is due to you. It was I who gave my maidservant into your bosom. And when she saw that she has conceived, I became lowered in her esteem. Let Hashem judge between me and you. Here you have an argument between Sarah and Avram. All marriages have some type of dispute at some point or another. If you don't have a dispute, it's usually because one of the spouses died. But generally speaking, if you're both alive, you're going to have a dispute. It happens from time to time. But a healthy marriage also has solutions. Here we see that Sarah is upset with Avraham and Chachamim say it's because she believes that Avraham didn't pray for her. And she is saying that uh, let Hashem judge between you and me. Let Hashem judge between you and me. So the Chachamim say when a person makes the mistake of uttering the words let Hashem judge you then a Kadosh Baruch Hu says, okay, you want me to judge somebody? Let me judge you first and see how you are. And then I'll judge what you want me to judge. So when Sarah, in essence, asked Hashem to judge uh, you and I, do let Hashem judge you, in essence, uh, 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 he's going to judge both of us, but in essence, judge you because you're the one that's wrong. Hashem judged her, and in essence, she lost years of her life now that explains why she lived a shorter life but it doesn't explain why Avraham cried less for her so the Zohar Kadosh says something that if it wasn't written we wouldn't be allowed to say it it wouldn't be allowed to say it the Zohar Kadosh says in Parashat Chayi Sarah Avraham is teaching us you're not allowed to cry mourn over somebody that commits suicide meaning when Sarai Menu says let Akadosh Baruch Hu judge between you and me she was saying things that were the equivalent of suicide in our level needless to say none of us should ever say to our wives or our husbands oh let Hashem judge you or even to anybody else Hashem will judge you who are you to tell Hashem to judge anybody and who are you to to even say such things at all judge yourself you want to help somebody tell them they're doing something no problem but judging that's not our job we're not the Sanhedrin we're not the Sanhedrin Sarai Menu Kodesh Kodeshim uttered a few extra words with all of our holiness and Akadosh Baruch Hu says you asked me to judge Avraham that means I also have to judge you and when I judged you I decided to shorten your life by almost 50 years in comparison to Avraham Avinu now of course 
She lived her life. She lived a full life. She's Kodesh Kodeshim. We cannot even be the dust under her feet. But the point here that the Chachamim is saying to us here, what they're teaching us here, is that in the eyes of Avraham Avinu, like, listen, I love her. She's my wife. She's, she's amazing. She's Kodesh Kodeshim. She's the greatest thing in the world. But she made a critical mistake. And due to that critical mistake, I cannot mourn her. I'm not allowed to mourn her the same level as I would if it didn't happen. Meaning that Rabbi Karim, when a person understands the message from this week's parasha of how a righteous person doesn't get more righteous than Sarai Menu, uttered a few extra words to her husband, needless to say, her husband, saying, let Hashem judge you. Sarah, you made a mistake. That mistake was costly. Now, if it was costly to Sarai Menu, that's a perfectly righteous person. If it was written inside the Torah with the special chaf that we have to learn over and over and over again every single year for eternity, then that means that speaking idle words or forbidden words, which is what the Gaomi Vyona is talking about in this section of the letter, how much more so do we need to be careful of? If someone as righteous as Sarai Menu was judged that way, if someone as righteous as Sarai Menu is noted in our own parasha, Chayes Sarah, Sarah, Tzadika, lived a life, amazing, all good stuff, but that mistake, that deserves a small letter, a small chaf. Why? So you could learn about that small mistake that she made for eternity. If she as righteous as she is, our mother, most righteous person on planet earth ever if she was judged so heavily for saying something we don't even think is a big deal how will we be judged for the things that are a big deal and we even know it because it's forbidden words forbidden statements curse words all types of swears all types of lies cheating, Lashonara, or most common, nonsense. Talk about sports, talk about markets, talk about all types of things that are not really necessary for your day-to-day life. If it's your job to talk about investments, that's one thing. But if it's not, why do you need to talk about it? Especially at Bet Knesset. Especially on Shabbat. Especially with people that have no rhyme or reason to have a benefit or a loss from the conversation. Maybe we should choose a different language. Maybe we should choose a completely different conversation. And if we can't come up with it, perhaps we should just shut up. I think we'll be better for it. Sometimes we need to know that the best thing we can do is be quiet. The best thing we can do is be quiet. Being quiet, Rabotai Karim, is an extraordinary thing for a person. So much so that the son of Rabbi Shimon Bar Yochai says in the Mishnah in Avot, I've been around many wise men my whole life. Meaning he learned much wisdom from wise men, wise men of Torah. And he says, I've never seen I've never learned something that's more beneficial from all of these wise men than being quiet. Why? When I was quiet, first and foremost, I was able to learn more. When I was quiet, I didn't expose my stupidity. When I was quiet, I didn't expose my ignorance. When I was quiet, I didn't make any mistakes. When I was quiet, I didn't make any sins. And on and on and on. A person that doesn't have value in the words that they say other than their own self-worth they think is worth something, like their own words are worth something, they need to hear themselves talk, really you have to think about it, whether you need to talk as much as you do. We all do. We all need to think about it. And I tell you that if I was not a speaker telling people what the Torah says on a regular basis, whether it's privately or publicly, it would be very, very difficult for a person like me to 
keep myself contained. Why? Because naturally I speak a lot. And I'm not talking about just because I'm a speaker. My whole life, I've been a, I've been a salesman, I've been a uh, person that speaks, that leads people, and so on. So for me to just go put myself into some cave and never talk to another person would have been too drastic of a change from where I was to, uh, to that. Perhaps I may end up going to a cave one day and, uh, and, and, and go learn like Rabbi Shimon Bar Yochai. But it will be a much smaller change. Why? Because there's a lot of foundation that came before that happened. You see, Rabbi Karim, when a person doesn't understand the magnitude of his words, the, the price that he's going to pay, the reward or the punishment, they can do anything. They can do anything and some of those things, some of those things are uh, too expensive. Let's just say that. Let's just say that. It's too expensive. We'll finish off with a story that I think is a uh, connected in a way, uh, simply because number one, it's a good story, <laughs> and uh, number two, it's a uh, it'll give you something valuable to say um, instead of the junk that most people talk about. The next time you want to say a story uh, to someone, it's connected to a kadosh baruch Years ago, there was a uh, pretty significant keila of Jews in Istanbul, Turkey. And uh, at the time, there was a king. And the king was friendly to, uh, to the Jewish people, relatively speaking. There wasn't any major animosity. There were Jews there fulfilling Torah and mitzvot. And the Jews respected the king. Now, this king was unique in a sense that he would sometimes go into the markets pretending that he's a commoner. And one day, he forgot himself, and he continued walking, walking, and walked by himself into the uh, the woods. All of a sudden, three bandits jumped on him, tackled him, and robbed him of everything that he had, and took him as a hostage. Now, a few minutes later, they told him, listen, we have to kill you so you don't go and Call the police and the king will have us killed. So at that moment, the king knew they didn't know that he's the king. They benefited from the money he had on him, but and the jewels, but they didn't know what they really had in their possession. And here's where the king chose to stay quiet. Quiet was key to his survival. But they wanted to kill him. What is he going to do? The king was smart and he told the bandits... I have a way for you to benefit much more than killing me. And Benson said, what? He said, I have a talent. I know how to make very expensive rugs. If you give me the tools and the material, I'll make some rugs and you're able to go to the market and you'll sell it for a fortune. You'll make a lot of money out of each rug. These bandits who do not want to have a regular day job because they like stealing more than they like a, uh, you know, working or, or having an honest living. They like this idea. So they went to the market, they bought the materials, the tools, and they came back and they gave the king. And before you uh, know it, the king came out with a beautiful rug. And he says to them, go into the market and sell this, but make sure you sell it for this price which is going to seem expensive to anybody who doesn't know rugs. So only sell it to somebody that can truly appreciate it. So the bandit goes to the market, tries to offer this rug. People laugh at him in his face. This rug is like usually as a towel. Why do you want $500 for it? No, no, it's a special rug. He gets laughed at from place to place, but he remembers what the king told him. And he's in the market. The people surrounding him see this strange guy trying to sell a $500 rug. They don't even think it's worth $5. Until a wise Jewish man by the name of Aaron sees this and he says to him, how much do you want for that rug? And he tells him the price. He says, let me see that rug. Aaron sees the rug and he says, this is a very unusual rug. You know what? Come to my store with me. I'm going to buy it from you. He comes to the store and he gives him the money. 
And the uh, says to him, do you have any more of these rugs? He says, yeah, I have more. So all right, anytime you have a new rug, come to me. So the bandit is happy. He goes on his way. Aaron looks at the rug. Sees an unusual rug. But the reason why he bought it is because he saw that in the rug, there's a letter in Hebrew. And he's not really sure what this letter is doing here on this rug. It's an unusual place to have a Hebrew letter. So, a short while later, the king makes another rug, and he comes back to Aaron, and he sells him the rug. And now he has another letter. And a little while later, he comes back with another few rugs, and he has a few more letters. And before you know it, after a short period of time, Aaron discovers that on these rugs, it spells the name of the king. Aaron comes to the palace of the king and finds out that the king has been missing for already a few weeks. No one knows what to do. They haven't really disclosed it to anyone. And he asks the people, I want to see the queen because I have a special message for her and her ears only regarding the king. He gets the queen in front of him. Everyone is hysterical and he tells her the news that he has these rugs that he gets from these bandits. And it has her husband, the king's name on it. Of course, she brings a soldier. She says, listen, keep buying those rugs. Let's see what else we can get. Let us, let's see what else we can get. So he continues buying the rugs. And before you know it, he also has the next several rugs spell out the exact location of where the king is being hidden, is being imprisoned. A short while later, the bandits are celebrating all of this newfound money from this newfound money making machine that they have making them rugs but the king is praying that someone is going to be able to decipher his quiet scream for help and his prayers are answered because the army surrounds those bandits, arrests them, saves the king. And after the king goes back to the palace, he invites Aaron that saved him to decipher this message. And he tells him, you saved my life. You were clever enough to see the message. I want to give you a reward. And Aaron says, no, I don't want a reward. I appreciate the king, treat the Jewish people well. So the king says, fine. Here's a special card that you can use and your children can use and all of your family can use that you have free access to our palace to ask from the kingdom, whatever you want. And Aaron takes this and time passes and the king dies and Aaron dies. And the king's son takes over the throne. And one day the king goes into the market like his father used to, but he still looks like a king. And he sees that all the Jews are running around and he asks his vizier, his uh, general, if you will, why are all these Jews running around? And the vizier says to him, it's because they have their holiday of Pesach. The king says, Pesach? What's that? He says, Pesach is when they eat these matzahs. And some of them even eat this matzah shmura. The king asks, what is the difference between the matzah and the matzah shmura? He says, the matzah shmura has the blood of Muslim children. The king is baffled. What? What What do you mean Muslim? We're Muslim. What do you mean? They eat our kids? The vizier says, yeah, they eat our kids every year. So the king says, to the vizier, I want you to get me the names of all the people that admit that they're going to eat matzah shmura, and we're going to arrest them on their day of holiday before they eat. And that's what he collects the names. This anti-Semitic vizier, who made this whole thing up, collects the names, and now they're planning a major arrest and a trial with a death penalty for anyone that bought this matzah shmura. 
a few days before Pesach, just a couple of days, Aaron's son, his name is Shmuel, he has a dream. In his dream, his father, Aaron, comes to him. He says to him, Shmuel, get up. Go to the family safe. Get the special card that I received from the king that allows us access to the palace when I saved the king's life. Go and tell the king not to listen to the vizier, not only because it's not true, and the Jewish people do not eat the blood of Muslim children, but rather the hatred of the vizier, of the Jewish people, is only because he himself is our common enemy. He's not even a Muslim. He's actually a Christian idol worshiper who sleeps with a cross every night. And the king can go and verify that what I'm saying is true by sending his soldiers to surprise the vizier at night and look through his window and they'll see that this vizier sleeps with a big cross on his chest which is something completely forbidden both for Jews and for Muslims. So Shmuel didn't think much of this dream, even though most of us would think much of it, but his father came back to him as soon as he went to sleep again, and he realized that this is a serious dream. He had this dream twice, just like Paro had the dream twice, and that's how we know it has meaning. Nebuchadnezzar had the same dream twice in the same night, has meaning. So he got up and he went to the palace and he asked for the audience of the queen first. And he told the queen what he dreamt and the queen did not know if she could trust this Shmuel. Although his father was a righteous man and saved her husband's life, still maybe he's just trying to do something. So she went and she asked her son, the king, if he is going to kill the Jewish people because she had a dream that he's not supposed to hurt the Jewish people because they didn't do anything wrong. What is being said about them is a lie. And when the king admitted that he really did have a plan to kill the Jewish people and he thought it was perfectly right, she knew that not only was Shmuel telling the truth, but the dream that he had was true. And she allowed Shmuel to meet with the king who took him on his offer and sent his soldiers to the vizier's house only to see the vizier sleeping with a huge cross on his chest just like the idol worshippers do. And he realized that this trap that the vizier was giving was not because he loved the king but rather because he loved himself he loved his idol and he wanted to do anything possible to create friction between his two enemies, the king and the Jews. King killed the vizier. The Jews obviously were saved by Hashem and we're here to tell the story. Now, in this story, Rabotai Karim, we have an endless opportunities for people to say the right thing and the wrong thing. Of course, HaKadosh Baruch Hu is going to help us as a nation when time comes that we need special assistance from heaven but on your day-to-day when you're having conversations with your co-workers with your employees with your wife with your husband with your children only the torah that we learn that's going to remind us of the magnitude of each one of our words will be the tools that we have to overcome these obstacles because we can't ask Hashem to perform a special miracle for us every time we're about to say something wrong it's good to know these stories because at least we can tell them to somebody else and they won't make any sense during that time but in order for us ourselves not to say something wrong we need to know more than just one story Baruch Adonai Le'olam Amen Amen. <laughs>
אני מברך, אני מברך את הרבנים, רגע, 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 אני מברך את הרבנים, הרב ירון ראובן, הרב אפרים כחלון, ראשי ארגון בעזרת השם, שהלכו בפעליון, שעלו מעלה מעלה, יהיה להם ברכה והצלחה, הקדוש ברוך הוא ימלא בלשונות ליבם, לטובה ולברכה, שבכל מה שיפנו, יזכירו ויצליחו, יזכירו לעשות כאלה וכאלה, הודיעו תורה לאדירה, אמן ואמן. הוא היהודי הזה, הוא היה מיליונר, סגר את כל הביזנס, אמר אני משקיע פה בעולם מה שזה טוב. איפה הוא גר? בפלורידה. בפלורידה. איפה זה פלורידה? אמריקה. כן